Today's presenter uh, is Julia Frankowski, who is the Government Information Librarian at Michigan State University. She received an MIS from Wayne State University and a BA in History from Michigan State University. And today she's going to talk about the APIs of data.gov, uh, which if you're interested in this topic, I'm sure she's going to mention this, is actually an article in um, the journal Do Documents to the People, um, go to its art, uh, journal. Um, so if you're interested in more of this, definitely take a look at that article. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hopefully see my slides? Um, I should be sharing my screen right now. Um, I want to thank you all for joining uh, us for this webinar today uh, on the APIs of data.gov. So at the end of today's webinar, you will be able to understand and explain what an API is, know how to navigate data.gov to find the APIs, and have an understanding as to how you might use APIs in your projects. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end of today's presentation. So what exactly is an API? APIs are everywhere. They're in our apps, they're in our websites, our software, our online widgets. But unless you're a web developer, you might not really understand their purpose or their importance. So here's the formal dictionary definition. Application programming interfaces, or APIs, are a software tool which performs a particular computational function, um, and APIs act as building blocks, allowing software developers to create new applications without having to code every function from scratch. Technical stuff, but what exactly does that mean? Uh, so in non-technical words, what that's really saying is that APIs allow for seamless access and use of information, information and data stored elsewhere. So this means that developers don't need to write every piece of code from scratch. They just need to write code to retrieve information or data from the API that contains that necessary information. Uh, so because the code is retrieving information that's elsewhere, it means that this data and information does not need to be stored and updated on your own database. Um, it's stored and updated centrally. Because of these aspects, it makes the development of websites, apps, widgets, software, etc., much more efficient because you're not doing everything from scratch. So here's some more technical information about APIs that you don't necessarily need to know, but I'm going to point it out just to be thorough. So APIs are built with a series of protocols such as SOAP, uh, which is an older protocol, and REST. And these protocols are combined with formats like JSON and XML, um, which are both human and machine readable uh, formats. With the combination of protocol and format, an API is born, and this API has the ability to offer a variety of functionality that other developers can tap when those developers are creating their own interfaces. In order to actually use the API, though, you'll need to know a scripting language such as Python or PHP. Using these languages, developers can write commands to access the information and data from the API. So good APIs have uh, documentation for how to use them, such as example queries and commands, so that developers who are trying to take advantage of all that the API has to offer don't have to guess what command does what. Uh, so they would have example code of using this uh, parameter gets you this information that's stored in, in this API. So that way you have an idea of what exactly the API contains, what it can do, um, and how to write that code without having to you know, do a bunch of trial and error. If there isn't good documentation, it makes the whole process a whole lot harder. So why would anyone want to use an API? Uh, you don't need to download, store, or update any of the data or information in your own database. This means that every developer is using the exact same data and information. And since it's in an API, anyone can access and use that data. Um, this is great for uh, making sure that there's consistency across uh, different apps or websites. Um, and just the process of having to make sure everything is updated in all the places can be really tricky. So having it in one central location, such as an API, makes it a lot easier. You update it in one spot and it updates everywhere. APIs also help create a more seamless user experience um, by enabling developers to create interrelated systems. So this seamless integration is one of the reasons why we often don't realize we're accessing information from an API. An example is when you're on a store's website and you're looking for the closest store to you. Uh, you can type in your zip code and to find the nearest store. And chances are you're using Google Maps API when you type in your zip code um, in order to find the closest location. So that's one example of how there might be an API behind all that. But you don't see any of that. You just see a little search box. You type in the information. Um, there's a 
there's stuff in the code that calls to the Google Maps API, retrieves that information, generates it on that web page that you're on, and you have no idea any of this is going on. And additionally, APIs help save developers time since they won't have to rewrite code for every little thing. Uh, they just need to write code to access that API. So if you wanted to find near store without accessing a Maps API, for example, it, there would be a lot of geolocation and things like that, and it would be this huge, horrible mess. Uh, so with the API from Google or any other mapping-related software thing, um, it makes it all a whole lot easier for everyone, and then you don't have to spend a lot of time writing all this new code and everything. So now that we've talked a little bit about the basics of APIs, we're going to move on to talking about data.gov and how to get around it to find APIs. Data.gov is a clearinghouse for locating not only governmental data sets, but also APIs in an attempt to foster a more open government. By creating APIs that the public can access, uh, can use to access government information and data, agencies and other governmental organizations can allow others to spend time and money developing user interfaces to access this information. So developing apps and websites, uh, it uses a lot of developer time, and time means money. Uh, and so by allowing anyone to make these um, apps, websites, software, whatever, with open government information, it allows these agencies to go and use their resources to do other things. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the agencies and other government organizations aren't making their own apps and interfaces. It just means that other people have the option to make something. So maybe they see government information in a way that the agency may not have seen a use for it, um, integrating it with other resources that are outside of the government um, to try and make a better product that maybe falls outside the scope of the agency. So it can really add to more widespread um, usage of free government information. This is what the homepage of data.gov looks like, in case you've never been there. You can search in the giant search box for certain topics, and this will pull up everything on that topic. Or you can click on data up at the very top um, center of the page to give you more advanced searching options. Clicking data gives you a lot of faceted options on the left-hand side. Uh, if you scroll towards the bottom, you can select API as the format to pull up only items listed as having API as a format. And as you can see, there's quite a few data sets with APIs that are available. But there are some caveats that go along with using data.gov. The APIs and other data are not actually hosted on data.gov, but on other agency websites. And this means that sometimes when you click on a link, you might not get taken to the page you were expecting. If links change and it's not always updated in a timely fashion. Also, certain APIs, like those from the Census or NASA, require you create an account first in order to get an API key uh, to use them. And these keys um, are pretty common when using APIs. Uh, the keys are usually used for tracking your activity uh, so that the creator can see who is using their API and in what manner, which can sound a little bit scary, uh, but it can also be good for the agency to see that the API is actually in use. So they can warn you if they decide that they want to discontinue the API, for example, or if there are going to be major updates, or if the URLs are going to change, they can always uh, get back to the, uh, the users by looking at the key and seeing who's actively using it and let them know that huge changes are coming or it's being discontinued or what have you. Uh, another huge issue uh, is that not all APIs have documentation on how to use them which can make them very, very challenging. It's sort of hit or miss on data.gov as to whether there is any documentation, if the documentation is really poor, if it's acceptable, or if it's actually pretty good. So sometimes you'll look at an API and there's absolutely nothing there to tell you how to use it, and so you kind of have to play around with it yourself to try and figure out what you can do with it, what exactly does it contain, what, um, what calls it and commands it responds to, that type of thing. So here's an example of what you'd see when you click on a page you find on data.gov. This is for NASA's Astronomy Picture of the Day API. Um, and if you click where the arrow points, in theory, you should get taken to a page with information on the API. Uh, but as you can see, it takes you to a page that says you need an API key. Um, so you actually have to go to api.nasa.gov to request a key and it'd make a lot more sense for the link to automatically direct you to that page rather than this error page, but it doesn't, so you just kind of have to deal with it. 
uh, and copy and paste. Uh, requesting an API key from NASA is really painless. This is part of the page that you get. Uh, you just add your name, your email address. If you want, you can put in your purpose, uh, but it's not required. And then they supply you with a key almost instantaneously. Not all agencies are this speedy when it comes to supplying keys. Uh, I requested a key from the Bureau of Labor Statistics a few days ago, and they still have not responded to me. So uh, it's one of those things where I don't know if there's human review going on for those things, um, but NASA is very speedy, and they actually have a very nice API documentation uh, to show you um, what you can do. So this is an example of part of their API documentation. It shows you the um, HTTP request. So you would copy that link, and that's the link that you would use to get information from, and then any query parameters. So you can use latitude, longitude, um, date ranges, um, and then you put in your API key, and this gives you an example query of what it should look like when you are writing your um, your uh, query. So for this example, uh, what this particular example does is it's for if you've ever wondered when was the last time NASA took a picture of your house, your institution, or a location that you can think of, um, this query would tell you and it would actually give you a, a URL to view the picture that was taken of whatever location you plug in with the latitude and longitude. So it's kind of neat in that you can figure out that type of thing. But we'll come back to the NASA API a little bit later in some of our examples. Um, but right now we're going to move on a bit to some examples of how others are using data.gov APIs. The nonprofit organization, the Sunlight Foundation, is always building really neat tools and websites to keep track of different aspects of government and things like that. Uh, Clear Spending uses the data.gov API from USAspending.gov, among other sources, to show where money is going, basically. Um, and so they give different scorecards, um, and it's really neat um, to play around with uh, and to see how exactly they're using information that they, they get from uh, USA spending as well as other resources to see where exactly money is going. And this is an example of an iOS um, app for the congressional record. Um, while the APIs offered on data.gov might be free and the information that they're providing is freely available, that doesn't mean that developers who use the APIs aren't going to try and profit off of their creation. So here in this app, uh, these developers are actually charging money to users to access different issues of the congressional record. So you can buy this one from 2014 for 99 cents and others, um, all for 99 cents or subscribe, uh, which is a little ridiculous because there's also another iOS app from the Library of Congress that does the congressional record, and it provides all the information for free on your phone. Uh, so it's one of those things where people are always trying to take advantage of reselling things that are free in order to make a profit off of people who may not realize that this stuff is freely available. And the Department of State has created the Smart Traveler app that has the latest travel warnings, alerts, and country information for those planning to travel outside the U.S. So once again, you update the information in the API one place, and then anything that's accessing that API gets updated automatically. So you can get the latest warnings, and any other similar app um, would have um, the latest alerts and things of that nature for traveling. So those are just a couple of examples of APIs in use, but there are tons more since APIs are really everywhere. Um, now that you know a little bit more about APIs, where can you go to learn more? Uh, code Academy is a great interactive training website that allows you to learn all sorts of code. Um, so here's an a listing of all that they offer. Um, for working with APIs, I'd recommend learning PHP, Python, and hey look, they even have a Learn APIs course. Um, and look at that. This one that's highlighted, one of the options is to learn how to use Python to access the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's API. Uh, all these courses are free. They're at your own pace. Um, you just mess around with it when you have some time. Um, and it's a great way to expand your skill set. 
And another fantastic site to use is W3 Schools, um, which is also free and also at your own pace. Uh, and here is a listing of all that they have to offer. Um, PHP, JSON, and XML would all be helpful for working with um, API. Learning to code is all well and good, uh, but what if you don't have, want to build your own tools, but you still want to see what an API can do so you can recommend it to, you, to those who are developers, maybe at your own institution? Uh, there are some tools out there that let you see the functionality of an API and let you play around with it a bit without needing to know too much in the way of code. So this is a great way to play with uh, an API, uh, especially if it has good documentation to pretty much walk you through what you're doing. One such tool is called Postman. Um, so head on over to that page. Um, so it's a downloadable app for Chrome or Mac. I've already downloaded it. I'm a, a Mac user. Um, and so this is what the interface looks like. It's nice because it saves all of your queries that you've done on the left-hand side so you can go back and see what you've done. It also has um, basically the, the start of any command. So you have different options. And the ones you're most likely to be used when you use an API are get and, um, and post requests. Um, but mostly you're going to be using get requests. So basically you're going to be asking the API, get me this information. So let's go back to the NASA page. Um, so, let's see. so this is the NASA's um, astronomy picture of the day. They give us our HTTP request, so this is where you would put, it says get, um, and then you would just copy that link, go back to Postman, enter your URL. And if you just send, you'll see it gives you an error message because you need an API key, um, which I had already requested. Uh, this key is not any sort of authentication or anything, so it's okay if people see it. It's just basically tracking my usage. Um, so I would click on params, which means parameters, and this allows me to start building my query. So you don't have to build some long, crazy string up here. You just have to start adding parameters to kind of build your, your question that way. So it's kind of like advanced searching in a database almost. So we do API underscore key, and then value, paste in my, um, my key, send, and it gives you in uh, JSON format information about the picture of the day for today. Default is going to be today. So it gives you an explanation of what the picture is. Um, and then it also gives you a URL. So we can open up the URL. One weird thing about this is once you click on it, you do have to click send again to get it. And it provides you with the pretty picture. Going back to um, the, the information about the API, you can see you, you can do a, diff, a couple of different things. You can also add different dates. So default is today, um, but you can also see what pictures are for different days using this. So let's go back to our original query. Um, let's add in, under key, we can add in date because as it shows here, date is a parameter that we can add. The format is going to be year, month, day. So I want to see what the picture was for my birthday this past year. So we can send. It once again gives us the information with a text explanation and then also the URL. We click on the URL, have to say send again, and that's the picture that it provides. Um, and so you can do this with pretty much any date. Uh, so one thing you can do with this is you can build like a little widget or something for your website if you so wanted uh, to display the picture of the day, or you can have it so people can put in different dates and it would call to the API and uh, show you whatever the picture of the day was for that particular day. So in addition to um, Postman, which is an app that you have to download, um, while it's free, there's also Hurlit, which has this lovely vomiting unicorn as their, their mascot, um, but this is a browser-based tool. Um, and as you can see, the setup is very similar to what Postman looks like. The only difference is you don't have to download anything. Um, it doesn't save what you've done in the past, so you can't go back and see what your previous requests were, um, but that's okay. So once again, uh, we can do, and we know we need to start adding some parameters because um, we need a key. Once again, it would be API key, um, 
API underscore key, and then let's add another parameter for date, and let's see what the picture of the day was for um, the first of this year. Uh, I'm not a robot, so I'm going to launch the request. Um, and it gives us a whole bunch of information about this particular file. Once again, the explanation, um, the URL, which we can open. And so this is the picture of the day for 2016. So what's nice about um, well done documentation is that you can, like I said, you can easily look at this and see what exactly you can do with it. You can see it's a get request, you can see the URL, you can see the date, you can see what to do. Um, and it gives you the example query, but because you're using one of these tools, you don't have to do all of this, um, you know, writing the URL yourself. You can uh, just build it basically using, um, using these different parameters. Uh, so that's just one aspect of this particular NASA um, API. They also have uh, an option where you can see uh, when was the last time uh, that NASA took a picture of my house, for example. Um, and it shows you how to do the, the request. Um, you have to get the latitude and longitude, which you can pull from Google Maps. Um, and then you can set like a begin date and an end date if you want. Um, and then see the URL that and generate the picture very similarly to um, what we just did with the picture of the day. Uh, what's weird about this is if you wanted to do something where you um, where you wanted to create like an app or something that allowed people to just plug in their address and see when was the last time NASA took a picture of their house, there would actually be a number of API calls that would have to happen. Uh, because when we just do one request, it gives you a list of all all the pictures that have been taken. And so it makes it so uh, there's a lot of different steps involved in that, which makes it rather confusing. So let's do, and it's working on pulling up all the different options to show you when were, were the times when NASA took pictures at this latitude and longitude. And for whatever reason, it's taking a while to load. Maybe this is a very busy time for NASA. Terribly sure about what's going on, but like I said, it would give you a list of all of the different all of the different times that NASA took pictures of, of your house, and then you would be able to to see um, to do with options to view the URLs and see the pictures. Um, so that's just some of the stuff that you can do with this. Um, as I said, there's tons of um, different options in this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, really good documentation. So I would recommend playing around with the NASA API uh, just because it has so much to offer. The documentation is is very easy to understand. It's not many um, tons and tons of pages, and it's not very technical in nature. Um, and because they give you nice examples and everything, uh, it makes it so it's a very approachable API to use, unlike some of the others that you may find on data.gov, um, where it's just kind of hit or miss. That is all that I have for you all. I didn't want to get too in the weeds with this, because I know it's, APIs are a very complicated topic. And, um, so I'm happy to answer any questions, and I encourage you all to play around um, with APIs. Uh, you can try Postman. You can try Hurlit. There are also other API tools out there. Um, but they kind of just give you a sense of what an API can do and get you an idea of what you can do with it. And if you want to try integrating it into any of your own um, your own widgets, software, websites, things like that. And there's actually a question, Julia, while you're doing okay. that. I was just going to um, read this from James. Uh, are there any libraries? And this is for, I think, for a lot of attendees, too, because you might there might be people who know about this happening. Are libraries building APIs into their collections? You know, I don't know if there are any who are building them into their collections. I know here at Michigan State, we have people who are working on building APIs in order to access different data sets that we've acquired from um, other places, for example, like ProQuest and things like that. Um, but we're not necessarily putting it in the collection the way you put, like, a book. Uh, we just kind of have it out there as an interface in order to interact with these different collections. So I guess in some ways it is kind of being integrated into the collection as since it's an interface to access these data sets and everything. But I don't know, it's, it's kind of a, an early stage of the game at this point. I could see collecting data sets from government agencies and then offering APIs when not, one other way to access. Yeah, definitely. I think that would be an interesting way to do this. And um, 
I think uh, it would definitely take all of us a little bit plugging around and <laughs> playing around with it to, to be able to get to that point. But that would be really cool. Um, yeah, definitely. Maybe, yeah, I mean, why would you use API versus just giving the link to the web page where API is already in use? Well, the API is basically just, it's structured, not really human-friendly data and information. Uh, the By building like a widget or something to use, accessing that API, it gives it a pretty interface for users to interact with. So APIs are kind of all the, the blah code that most humans look at and don't really know what to do with. And then the interface that you build in order to interact with the API gives it the pretty face um, and the approachableness that our users expect. Have you had any data reference questions where accessing data via API came in useful to you or the researcher? That's a great question. I have not encountered that situation. Um, uh, we just hired our data librarian, so I don't know if they've had any questions. Um, we've been without a data librarian for a while. Um, so I'm not sure if our previous one ever had this issue or anything like that. This is just something that kind of I like to play around with. And I haven't yet seen questions, but I wouldn't be surprised if in the future I got a question from like a political science faculty member who needs help accessing uh, information that would be best handled by using an API in order to get at um, and then having to have some sort of interface in order to access that more more easily. Um, but we have several programming librarians on staff, um, so they would probably be the ones responsible for doing the actual legwork with building the code and the interface in order to, to interact with that API. My job would basically be locating an API that would be suitable for them for that purpose. They were wondering if other sites besides NASA have good documentation if you've run across particularly good sites for um, the, the, because NASA does seem to have a lot of assistance for or guidance for people who are trying to do this. Yeah, uh, I was looking through a bunch of them and many were, were not very good if they had anything at all. It was really scant and uh, kind of disappointing. Uh, census has pretty good documentation and then there was one that was um, it was something about Food Atlas, um, but it used ArcGIS, and it was it was very good, thorough documentation, but it was very, very long, very, very complicated um, because it was um, GIS mapping stuff. Um, it used census tract data and all sorts of all sorts of information to find out basically where uh, there was food insecurity and things like that in their API, uh, and it was. Well, good documentation, it was a lot to get through, um, but most of what I've come across uh, on data.gov are, one could almost say, barely APIs. They may just be uh, a data set, and you'll look at it, and it's like, well, it's just one data set that isn't really much of anything. It doesn't have any documentation to it. So, it, like I said, it's really hit or miss. I would recommend you can sort in data.gov by uh, most popular, and usually the most popular uh, APIs on data.gov have the best documentation to look at, um, which is why they're popular. People are actually able to use them. Yeah, and James is completely right. It doesn't make sense to have an API for one simple spreadsheet that's never going to be updated. It's going to be the same information over and over again. It's for more complex data sets, basically, things that, are, that will be um, updated frequently, um, things that have multiple variables in it, um, things like that. Um, well, what about pulling from different data sets, as Jenny asked? Um, you can do that. Uh, an API allows you, if you built the API, you can pull from different data sets in one place, and so you're not having to go from one data set to another. Um, this basically eliminates that step and puts it all in one spot, um, but you could pull from different data sets if you wanted to, um, but there's just a lot more like work. Yeah, and so there, as Jenny um, pointed out, that she means more like one data set like to pull data and then pull mapping data. So there are APIs that do pull, for example, like numerical data and then they pull uh, GIS data um, and then they put that together in a nice API that you can access that will combine those two. And so it makes it so you aren't having to go to both places and trying to mesh those things together. The API could 
pull those all together. Um, there is a question, would it be viable to use APIs as a collection development tool? I think that would be an interesting one. Yeah, I don't see why you couldn't use their API in order to, to make sure that you're collecting in, uh, all of the EPA data sets. Yeah, the problem is that it's possible that the API could go away, whereas web archiving, at least, you know for sure you're saving it somewhere. So that would be my main concern, is if you're only relying on the API, it's possible it could just disappear or um, be discontinued, and you may not know it. So you're, you're kind of, since you're not downloading any of the data when you're using the API, you're just sending a call to the API, you're not saving anything. So you don't have any sort of backup with that. All right. Well, unless there are any more questions, say thank you to our presenter. Yeah, you're welcome, and thank you all for attending.